Uh, the district is conducting a tax rate hearing this evening, giving uh, citizens time to be heard on the proposed property tax rates to be set by the Board of Education of the Francis Howell School District for the 2016-2017 year. Uh, notice of, of this hearing was published in accordance with the Missouri statutes. This is a snapshot of our assessed valuation in comparison to the prior year. 2016-17 is a non-reassessment year. Our assessed valuation did grow a little bit as a result of new construction primarily, but at a lower rate than it did prior to the recession. Overall, our assessed value increased about 1.5%, but prior to 2008, in a non-reassessment year, our assessed value would have grown by approximately 3%. This is a breakdown of our assessed valuation by category. District homeowners account for 71% of the district's total assessed valuation. Our commercial properties are about, account for roughly 12%, personal property for a uh, little over 15%, and then agriculture and railroad and utility account for half, one half of 1%. This chart shows our assessed value over time and I was, I was mentioning earlier, you can see uh, the column here is the fiscal year, so 2004-05 would have been a non-reassessment year, 3% growth, 2006-07, 3.4% growth, 2008-09, 2.6% growth, and of course in the recessionary period, those were, uh, we had very uh, stagnant growth, uh, but in 2017, just 1.5% growth, so about half of what we saw uh, in a non-reassessment year uh, prior to uh, 2008. This is a breakdown of our proposed tax rates by fund. Our incidental fund, $2.19.54. Our teacher's fund, $2.09.18. Capital Projects Fund, six cents, and our Debt Service Fund, 67.13 cents, for a total of $5.1.85 cents. $5 and this is a comparison of our tax rate uh, proposed for 2016-17 to the prior year. And again, our tax rate has changed just very, very slightly. Uh, minimally reduced as a result of the inclusion of the new construction in our overall assessed value numbers. Just for historical purposes, we first shared with the board uh, information about this tax rate in April when we did the projected tax liability notice. We then held a workshop with the board in August and then this evening is the hearing and this just shows the progression of the changes in those proposed tax rates uh, over time as we got additional information uh, from the assessor on our actual assessed values. This slide is a comparison of the tax rates for the five school districts in St. Charles County. For a number of years, Francis Howell had the highest tax rate in the county but voters recently approved tax levy increases for the school district of the city of St. Charles, the Fort Zumwalt School District, and the Wentzville School District. Uh, these uh, tax rate increases for those districts, coupled with the loss of our special purpose levy in 2014, makes our levy the next to lowest tax rate in St. Louis County for 2016. Graphically showing our tax rate, uh, the red bar indicating the proposed rate for the 2016-17 school year. Uh, just for comparison purposes, in 2004, our tax rate was $5.04, and that was after the 25 cent rollback. This slide is the same graphic, but it now has the red bars uh, showing where the board voluntarily reduced its tax rate uh, from 2004 to 2010 by 25 cents, and then in 2011 by 5 cents. This is an estimate of the revenue that the proposed tax rate would generate, and as you can see, we have estimated revenue of 115 million and some change, and we have a budgeted property tax revenue of 116 uh, million and, and some change. So 
uh, the tax rate is in keeping with uh, the budget that the board uh, adopted in, July, in June. We are required uh, by uh, state law to show the amount of new revenue as a result of reassessment. And of course, this is a non-reassessment year, so we have no revenue as a result of reassessment. Uh, we did have new construction this year, as I noted earlier, a little over uh, almost $18 million in uh, new construction. Uh, and we do get some additional revenue as a result of the new construction, but those are new taxpayers to the rolls who have not uh, previously uh, been taxes, taxpayers in the district. This is a sh slide showing the history of new construction. I think the big takeaway here is that in 2008, new construction was $46 million, $46.5 million, and today at almost $18 million, a little uptick from last year's new construction level, but still significantly below the levels that we saw uh, prior to the recession. This is our debt service uh, a snapshot. Uh, we made some assumptions about what would happen with uh, growth in our assessed valuation. Uh, the big takeaway here is just that within the debt service levy, there's little capacity right now uh, because the assessed value did not grow during the recessionary period in uh, the way that we thought it would. And so we actually will be spending down some of our accumulated debt service fund balance in order to make our principal and interest payments but we should soon be uh, at a point where the 67 cents will be sufficient to generate on a current basis what's necessary for our <coughs> uh, principal and interest payments. This is a chart that shows the residential ratios. This is prepared by the county assessor. Uh, the Im important thing to take away here is that the 100% mark uh, would be the goal that the assessor looks for at any reassessment time. The red bars indicate those years when, reass when the values in the county were actually above 100%, and so he had to, at reassessment time, actually lower the values rather than raise them. As you can see now, our values are down uh, around the 95% mark, and so we are hopeful that as we go into the next reassessment cycle next year, we will see a similar level of growth uh, that we did previously. But it's a, a, a welcome change from those uh, periods of time when the assessed values were not growing uh, and were actually above the uh, market values and we had a decline in our overall assessed value. This is just a snapshot of the breakdown of our uh, revenue uh, and I compare them at 10 year intervals, so uh, 10 years ago in fiscal year 07, uh, a little <coughs> over 71% of our total uh, revenue came from local sources, primarily property taxes. The state contributed 23.3 percent, uh, 4.1 percent from the federal government and 1.5 percent from the county. And today, 10 years later, the picture is relatively unchanged, 70.6 uh, percent from local sources, 23.9 percent from the state, 4 percent from federal, and 1.5 percent from the county. So even as the state has increased the amount or the dollars given to K-12 education, as a proportion of our operating revenue, uh, their overall proportion of support for school districts has not changed in 10 years' time. Uh, this is just a graphic representation of our state aid by year. Uh, the big dip there uh, shows that period in time in fiscal year six prior to the adoption of the current funding formula. And then after the implementation of that new formula, we did see our revenue rise. But the red bar indicates the peak period of state revenue collection. And you can see that just after we got into 2009, our state aid began to decline. And while we're seeing a slight uptick now, we're only back at the level that we were uh, in, in terms of total dollars uh, where we were in 2008. So we haven't seen any uh, significant growth in our state aid. And uh, the slight uh, downturn there shows that for the current year, uh, we're also not beginning to uh, uh, forecast a significant growth in our state aid. Uh, this is just a projection of what would happen if the formula had been fully funded, uh, that we would have continued to see some level of growth. And so the arrow indicates the gap that exists between what we're actually receiving from the state and what we should be receiving had they met their obligation to fully fund the formula.
Missouri uh, does offer a property tax credit, which gives uh, a senior citizens and some individuals who are 100% disabled uh, a rebate for a portion of the real estate taxes paid or the rent paid uh, by those individuals. Uh, the credit is for a maximum of $1,100 and can only be claimed on the home that they actually occupied during the period being claimed. And information is available from uh, the Department of Revenue website. This clicker is just not working. 2016 is a non-reassessment year. Our assessed values grew due to new construction but a much lower level than uh, prior to the recession. Our total assessed value is $44.6 million lower today than it was in 2009. Uh, state revenue is not increasing as a percentage of our total operating revenue and our proposed tax rate for 2016-17 is $5.1.85. This rate is relatively unchanged from last year. That's the end of my presentation, and if there are any questions from the board or the uh, audience, I'd be happy to address them. At this time, there's an opportunity to ask questions uh, from the community if you guys have any interest in asking questions. Yes, sir. Just go up, you have to go up to the podium, though. Sorry. <clears throat> right over there. <laughs> no. The question I have is how much stuff I did this last time. Um, this was this was a much better presentation than I saw the last time, really, when you came up. But I still have the question of the extra monies you're coming in. Where will it be used? Where will that extra money you have coming in that you're going to get from the tax increase? Where will it be used specifically? We have uh, ongoing costs of operation that are outside of our salaries uh, uh, in particular, uh, but the cost of providing uh, the benefits that we have for our, our employees continue to increase. The cost of medical insurance are continuing to increase. Uh, costs for our property and liability insurance continue to increase. Our, our transportation costs are increasing. The general cost of purchasing materials and supplies are increasing. and. Uh, utility costs are increasing. Uh, just some examples of the uh, uh, types of expenditures that we're obligated to do. We need to turn on the lights, we need to heat and cool our buildings, we need to get the kids to school, we need to provide them with some uh, level of supplies. The cost for all of that is going up. Uh, the new revenue generated as a result of new construction is about $1.2 million. Our operating budget is $183 million and the you know, we have a much more uh, you know, we see a much more significant increase in our costs than we see in the revenue coming in uh, as a result of new construction. So we don't have any uh, new uh, initiatives being planned uh, for the new revenue that's coming in. It will help to cover the ongoing costs of, of our operating expenses. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other questions at this time? Okay. The tax he hearing is closed. Thank you. <clears throat> And with this being 7 o'clock, I'll call the open session meeting to order. Uh, with us tonight is a star student, and the AP scholars are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. <laughs> Just so the uh, audience, uh, uh, there are seven board members here tonight, but there's only six sitting in chairs. We have Ms. Walker on, on the FaceTime, wonderful technology, and it's available to us now for 
uh, able, you're able to actually vote now on, on FaceTime. So she's out of town on business, and we're happy to have her in a six by four <laughs> phone. <clears throat> Board only ten motion to approve the uh, agenda is submitted. So moved. A motion by Ms. Mr. Summer and second by Ms. Ferguson. Any questions, board? By roll call. Mr. Lang. Aye. 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 Motion carries seven zero. Recognitions. Thank you, Mr. Lafada. The first thing we'd like to do is introduce you to our uh, first honorary student representative uh, for the new school year. And to do that, my buddy, Dr. Sonny Arnell. Yep. Um, I get the incredible honor to introduce tonight's board, student board representative. And before I, I talk about how incredible she is, I just want to acknowledge that tonight I wish you had 50 seats up there for all of our outstanding young people in the audience that are being recognized for their AP um, a, a recognition and, and achievement. Uh, we'll talk, well, I know we're, we're going to get to that in a moment, but um, uh, you're all outstanding, and I wish we had a spot for all of you up here. But I get the great honor of um, uh, introducing a great, ex a great um, a model and example of what our outstanding students are and who they are, and Miss Alicia Swanson. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, and this is one of those... I asked her, I said, just send me a couple things I could say about what, what you've accomplished in high school. And um, it's one of those things where I'm just thankful that I have a career and I'm not competing against her for a career. Um, I feel sorry for anyone that, that is not as prepared as, as the wonderful students in the classroom because you guys are awesome. But let, let's listen to, about Ms. Swanson for a moment. Um, her college choices at this point are, are Drake University in Iowa, Maryville in St. Louis, and Twin Cities in Minnesota. She's trying to make some decisions there. She wants to be actuarial science is what she's looking to, to, to go into. In high school, she's been involved in tennis, which she's the team captain the last two years, basketball, soccer, track and field, where she threw the shot and she ran long distance. She's on the principal's council, where she's my VP this year. Uh, NHS, she's the president this year. Um, she's in Epsilon Beta, where she is the vice president this year. She's on Arite, which is our student recognition committee. She's the junior class, she was the junior class president. In the newspaper, she's the multimedia editor in chief. She's a math tutor for our students in seminar. She was part of our Gateway to Change committee last year. She's won our Silver Shield for outstanding um, a character and recognition. She was part of Missouri um, Scholar Academy, and she was a Girl, Girl State alum. She does all those things in school while taking an outstanding load of, of our most rigorous courses and performing out incredibly in those courses. Outside of school, she works at Spencer's Library where she's a teen on the teen advisory board since the sixth grade. She works with Keene St. Louis, which works with um, students with disabilities to, to make their life and, and embrace and engage in the community at, at a greater place. And she's been a soccer referee at the SC, at SCCYSA the last several years. All of this, on a 4.0 scale, she has a 4.85. So um, it, and when I tell you we have outstanding young people and our future is bright and that she's a great example of all the people in the audience, I'm not kidding. We have an incredible student body, and I love that you all allow us to recognize students in this capacity and let them get up there and, 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 and honor our students, honor our, 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 our schools and their families. So please give a big round of applause for Ms. Alicia Swanson. And not surprisingly, we'll get to recognize Ms. Swanson again here in just a minute because she's also uh, an AP scholar. 
The Francis Howell School District is proud to announce that two budding scientists from Francis Howell North, James Dorman and Lavanya Kaluru, have successfully completed the Students and Teachers as Research Scientists, or STARS program, at UMSL. It takes special determination and passion to spend six weeks conducting intensive research when all of your classmates are relaxing and enjoying their summer. James and Lavanya were diligently working on their university level scholar research papers. James is entitled The Kuramoto Phase Transition in Large Arrays of Electrochemical Mi Micro Oscillators. Close? Uh, unfortunately, Lavanya could not be here tonight. Uh, the only silver lining to that is I don't have to pronounce her research project. As 2016 STARS graduates, both will receive a full scholarship to UMSL in addition to a $1,500 funded summer research opportunity provided in the field of their interest. FHSD is proud to be represented by two shining stars and congratulates them on their impressive scientific achievement. And we have here again tonight, James Dorman. Come on up, James. Congratulations, James. Thank you. The Advanced Placement Program recognizes high school students who have demonstrated outstanding college-level achievement through AP courses and exams with the AP Scholar Awards. Last year, the district had 233 juniors and seniors earn that prestigious award. There are four different levels to the AP award that students can achieve. The AP Scholar Award is presented to students who receive scores of three or higher on three or more AP exams. The AP Scholar with Honor Award is granted to students who receive an average score of at least 3.25 on all AP exams and scores of three or higher on four or more. Francis Howell School District had 47 students that earned the AP Scholar with Honor Award. The AP Scholar with Distinction Award is granted only to those students who receive an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams. The National AP Scholar Award is the highest level of AP distinction and is granted only to students who receive an average score of at least four on all AP exams taken and scores of four or higher on eight or more of these exams. We had eight students in the district last year earn the National AP Scholar Award. Only one is a junior, and he's here this evening tonight. We honor those juniors who achieved AP Scholar with Honor, Scholar with Distinction, or National AP Scholar status. So as I call your name, first of all, if I mispronounce your name, please correct me immediately. But as I call your name, come on up, get your certificate, and we're going to line everybody up in front here and take a group picture. First of all, from Francis Howell North, an AP Scholar with Honor, Christopher St. Alvin. From Francis Howell, an AP Scholar with Honor, Marie Dichiane. From Francis Howell High School, an AP Scholar with Honor, Catherine Epperly. From Francis Howell High School, an AP Scholar with Honor, Alexander Guerin. From Francis Howell High School, an AP Scholar with Distinction, Michaela Hardy. From Francis Howell High School, an AP Scholar with Distinction, Hamming Lin. And also from Francis Howell High School, a national AP scholar, Mr. Eric Hansen.
from Francis Howell Central and AP Scholar with Honor, Sydney Kaiser. From Francis Howell Central and AP Scholar with Honor, Samuel McCord. From Central and AP Scholar with Honor, Lucas Mendel. An AP Scholar with Honor, Mackenzie Morris. An AP Scholar with Honor, Maverick Stover. An AP Scholar with Distinction, Liam Blombaum. An AP Scholar with Distinction, Nicholas Dobbins. An AP Scholar with Distinction, Margaret Sills. An AP Scholar with Distinction, Rachel Stepanek. And our final AP Scholar with Distinction, Elisa Swanson, who you've already heard from. Pretend it's an AP test. Get close. <laughs> she will move you if she has to. Anyone who says we emphasize sports over academics obviously is not here on nights like this. Stack them like cordwood. We got room on top. You can come up here. And if any parents would, if any parents would like to take pictures, please come on up, parents. If you want to, if you want to get a good picture, parents, come on up. There, I'm in a good spot. We have the superintendent's QT cup in the picture. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations to all of our AP scholars. That concludes recognition. Thank you, Mr. Lafada. Okay. Test. Our microphone's not working, but welcome. Are you sure you have tonight free? <laughs> okay. Good. Well, welcome and uh, feel free to participate in the meeting. Uh, the only thing you can't do is vote, even though you probably are qualified at this point <laughs> based on all the committees and boards you sit on. But thank you for being here tonight. This one working yet? You can still see your monitor. You can still see your monitor. Okay, we're at the uh, patron comment portion of our meeting. Uh, during patron comments, patrons are invited to address the Board of Education. Please come to the podium so everyone can hear. Please adhere to the three minute time limit. The Board is interested in hearing the public's concerns and opinions, but we do not answer questions during this portion of our meeting. Questions and concerns will be addressed by Dr. Hendricks Harris and appropriate staff members um, uh, immediately uh, following uh, the meeting. Uh, we'll start working on them. They won't be done, obviously, but uh, we'll get them concerns to you. Um, I only have one patron comment. I'm not sure if anybody else wanted to speak during at this time, but it's Carl Peterson. 
I know the board, I'm sorry, my name is Carl Peterson. I want to thank you, Mr. LaFada, and I want to thank the board. Um, I know the board was sent a copy of a proposal or at least a detrimental uh, view upon the tax increase. And I'd just like to say this, I think if you've read it and looked at it, um, it's really talking about teacher salary, but it leaves out a lot of facts and it misconstrues some others. The fact that it leaves out is this. Our teachers are 42nd in the nation in pay. They are $9,000 less than average pay in the United States. The gentleman that did this report, talking about Francis Howell School District, and he uses the ACT score and he uses salaries, you can't do it the way he did it. The ACT scores, he wants to use the ATC scores from the districts here in St. Charles County, and then he compares it to our salary and draws some conclusions on that. Quite frankly, you can't use the ATC scores without knowing what percentage of the kids took the test. In Francis Howe, virtually all your kids take the ACT scores. In the other districts, somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of the kids take the test. Therefore, you can't use the figures that he has on here because obviously the bottom 25 to 35 percent of the other district kids didn't take the test. So you can't make that assumption, nor can you look at the salary of our teachers and compare it to other districts unless you look at the year's service. He's showing here that, <clears throat> excuse me, the winds bill is $6,000 less than, than what we have in salary. But they're also three years less experienced, so that almost totally makes up the difference in, in the, uh, the salary that we have compared to theirs. Also, we don't know about the number of master's degrees. That also plays in there. And whether or not we have certified teachers teaching the subjects that they are certified in. You don't have an English teacher that's teaching physics or a PE teacher that's teaching math. So we don't know that. So you might as well take this thing and just give it a heave. Nor does he tell you that right across the river from the bridge that I can go and see is Pattonville that pays $3,000 more than we do. And right across the Boone Bridge is Parkway that spends $5,000 more. But I do love the one where he compares us to Wentzville and to Fort Sumwald, and he's showing how much less they pay. Well, guess what? As uh, Mr. Supple pointed out, guess what they did? This is on 2015 data. Thank you. Your time is up. I will yield my time back to you all. Thank you very much. Just take this, hit the delete button, please. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. You're welcome. We don't intend a motion to approve the, uh, I'm sorry, we got FHEA, no? Uh, FISPA? We don't intend a motion to approve the patron comments report as presented. Motion by Mr. Haynes, second by Mr. Summer. Is there any discussion? Hearing none by roll call. Ms. Ferguson. Aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. We're going to retain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Summer, second by Mr. Lang. Is there any discussion? Hearing none by roll call. Mr. Lang. Aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. <clears throat> this time we'll be presenting the MSBA board report on the video screen.
Hello everyone and welcome to the Missouri School Boards Association's board report for the month of September. We thank you for the opportunity to share some news and information during a few minutes of your board meeting. We begin with a look at what's now known as Amendment 3, the initiative to expand early childhood education here in Missouri. It has officially qualified for the November 8th ballot according to the Secretary of State's office. The certification follows polling showing strong public support for the amendment. A survey of state voters found that the measure is backed by a roughly two to one margin. The Reverend Starsky Wilson, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Deaconess Foundation in St. Louis, tells those attending a recent news conference, investing in early childhood education has benefits both to the child and to society. And the research is clear that investments in early childhood education extend the life circumstances, uh, make more positive life outcomes for each and every one of our children, while also making economies thrive, building communities where that investment is made. So this, is, this gives us an opportunity to do both of those things, to reduce life income and life outcome gaps uh, for individuals in our community, to make children more well uh, and whole through our investments and in, uh, fulfilling our responsibilities uh, to them, and to make our communities more stable. Amendment 3 will establish a secure source of funding by raising Missouri's lowest in the nation cigarette tax to a level that's still one of the lowest in the nation, and putting that money into a constitutionally protected lockbox, ensuring that it goes to early childhood education. The amendment is supported by MSBA and a number of other groups. Teachers and other school district staff will be able to notify school administrators and others about an emergency situation with a touch of a button on their smartphones through a free app available to MSBA members through Crisis Go. When the panic button on the app is pressed, it will set off audible tones on multiple building responders' phones, and a GPS location of the emergency also will be sent. The app also allows school district officials and building administrators to monitor all panic messages from an app on a PC desktop. The app also includes a district-wide mass emergency notification channel that can set off sirens on parents' and students' devices during an emergency situation. CrisisGo is an emergency response network company headquartered in St. Louis. To sign up for the free app, you can visit the website address on your screen. The 2016-17 MSBA School Personnel Information Survey is now open. This survey collects information on the wages, salaries, and benefits of teachers and other school employees to help boards and administrators make fully informed personnel decisions. Member districts that complete the survey by November 21st receive free access to the data collected. Make sure your district's information is included in this year's database. If you are attending the 2016 MSBA Annual Conference later this month, be sure to stop by the new membership reception beginning at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, September 30th. There will be specific locations in the exhibit hall for you to meet with colleagues from your region of the state. This event replaces MSBA's fall regional meetings, which have been held in the weeks immediately following the annual conference in recent years. And be sure your board is represented at the Delegate Assembly to be held at 345 on Friday, September 30th. This meeting of the Delegate Assembly will be voting on legislative resolutions that will form the basis of our advocacy efforts for the coming year. That's it for this month's edition of the MSBA Board Report. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting, and so long from Columbia. So long. Okay, Mr. Summer. The, the next item on the agenda has to do with the delegate assembly as mentioned by Mr. Gann there, and that, that will occur on Friday. Uh, included with the information you received, just so you are aware of, is uh, the budget for MSBA for the current year. It's already been approved by the Board of Directors. Uh, really, the only action items that will be a very short meeting, I anticipate, is the uh, the two amendments that are proposed, and that's on pages uh, 8, 9, wait a minute here, 8, 9, 10, yeah, 8, 9, and 10. So the First Amendment has to do with uh, the Human Rights Act, and it's proposed by the Independent School District, and the second one has to do with public school 
funding proposed by the Camden School District. Uh, both of these amendments have been uh, recommended for adoption by the MSPA Executive Committee and the Advocacy Committee of MSPA. And unless I hear otherwise from our board here tonight, I will also vote in favor of these later this month. That's all I have. I guess you have the approval of the vote. Yay. Uh, is it best practice? Yes. Best practice. Ms. I'm sorry. Ms. White's on. Sorry. As part of the district's vision to increase college and career readiness skills for all graduates, Francis Howell Central High School has worked diligently to increase the number of students participating in challenging coursework. Advanced Placement, or AP courses, provide the rigor necessary to help prepare students for what they can expect when they attend college, as well as an opportunity to earn college credits and save families thousands of dollars in tuition. During the 2015-16 school year, a leadership team at Francis House Central embarked on an effort to recruit talented students who perhaps had never considered an AP class before due to a variety of obstacles. Tonight, we'll hear from a group of Francis House Central high school administrators and teachers who championed this effort. It is my pleasure to introduce building principal, Dr. Sonny Arnell, associate principal, principal, Mr. Luke Lammers, and AP teachers, Dr. Jennifer Miller and Ms. Lori Panul. All right. You can assist one. <laughs> Which one is it? Oh, it's that one. Click one. Click one. Yeah. Click, click <laughs> Two of them. The one that I tried in earlier was this one. This I one? pressed the button on the right. And it worked fine earlier. Or Vicky could advance your slides. You want to just do that? It's <laughs> sold. I like that idea. I like right. that idea. Well, I'll jump in and kind of start. Um, uh, I've had the, the, the wonderful pleasure of, of working at House Central for the last 20 years, 10 years as the principal. Um, when I, I left the district for one year, came back and began to look at our uh, offerings of courses that would, would allow our students to earn college credit um, while in high school and challenge themselves in a way um, uh, that increased their study habits, their test taking skills and time management um, and really prepare them for college. Uh, we didn't offer many courses. Uh, so working with central office, the other administrators in middle school, we began to attack the course offerings we had available to our students. We began to attack a spiral curriculum and, and more challenging coursework at the middle school and then really began to attack the concept that, that aligned the course with the national assessment. Uh, great things began to happen. Ten years ago we gave about 50 AP tests. Uh, last year we gave about 558 AP tests. That exposure, you were able to see some of the highlights tonight with all of our outstanding students and the recognition they're able to achieve and the preparation they are able to earn as they move to college. So I, I'm just really thrilled that we're, we've come a long way as a district. However, we began to see that a lot of our students were, were tackling um, those courses and taking many courses within the same year. So we had kind of two problems. One, it was a, a small section of our student body that challenged themselves with those upper level classes to sometimes high level of stress because they took many classes in a two year span. So our challenge was twofold. One, how do we make that, that become a three or four year program instead of a two year program? as well as how do we find students that aren't challenging themselves for whatever reason and, and invite them into that um, a rigorous course classwork. Um, and that's what we attacked last year. So with that, a history kind of point of view, I'm going to turn over to the incredible team that led that work out. Mr. Lammers, our associate principal, he um, uh, took that challenge and worked with all of our awesome AP teachers in our building to buy ownership and get the experts' viewpoints and really kind of tackled that problem and came up with a wonderful solution that'll let them explain. Do we have the next? Okay, so Mr. Lammers started the AP Steering Committee. There were representatives from most of the departments that have AP courses on the committee. And as members of that committee, we met and did some scholarly research on what drives kids into the AP courses, what we can do to help them be successful. 
And then in addition to that, we traveled to several schools in our area. We conferenced with schools outside of our area, as far away as Iowa. Um, if they were doing something, having better outcomes than we were, we wanted to know why. We wanted to know what they were doing to let the kids into the courses, if there were barriers that we have to our AP courses that those other schools didn't have, if there were other things they were doing to prepare the kids um, that we could also be doing. So we started doing that research and as a result, um, we've, we've made some decisions, we've expanded our program into the lower levels and Lucas and Lori will talk about that. Um, as Dr. Arnell had already said, we, we had the Elisa Swansons of the world that were taking five, six, seven AP courses. And so we really wanted to reach out to those students who hadn't taken any AP courses or had taken one, but that was enough for them. Um, and so the principals as well as guidance counselors and teachers started reaching out to those students who um, really could push themselves to take those AP courses. And we also um, looked into having an AP boot camp over the summer and bringing in some of those kids who didn't know, they, they knew AP was college level and was going to be rigorous, but they didn't know exactly what that entailed. And so with all the data, um, we had this vision of let's reach out to those kids who had yet to take an AP course. Yeah, and in general, our, our mission of the team that we did last year was to basically every kid that was considering going to college by the time they graduate should take one AP class at least to try to demystify it so they're more prepared for it once they get into college. And then secondary to that, if you're in an AP class, you should probably take the test for that class. We had a significant number of kids who were in the class who did not take the test for that class. So how did we build this system? Um, we didn't want it to just be... Uh, the, the research we were looking at, um, a lot of the high achieving AP schools did away with recruiting system, or did away with uh, recommendation systems. Uh, historically in AP, class, in AP classes in, in many schools, to get into the class you had to have a recommendation. And then a lot of the schools that we found, they didn't have that. If you wanted to take the class, you could take the class. So what we did is we tried to go about that in a little bit more of a, a structured way. We, have act, we are in a data rich district and we built spreadsheets, one for ninth graders, 10th graders and 11th graders that had all, I mean every academic marker that they have had since they were a student in this, um, in this district, we had a spreadsheet with all of that. And so rather than use all of that, um, I asked the AP teachers, what of these sets of data, uh, of this set of data, which marker should carry the most weight. What is the stuff that is the best predictor of a successful AP student? And then we use that information to build a formula called the AP predictor formula. And then we ran that through on each one of the spreadsheets and just kind of set a goal of, you know, your top 30% in every one of these should probably take an AP class. This is every academic marker says they would be successful in it. Um, and so that identified 616 kids. Uh, we, uh, those kids who had already taken AP classes, we sent letters home saying thank you for challenging yourself. Um, please continue to do so. But that left a significant number of other students who had not. And so what we did with those students is we divided that uh, large number of students by all of the principals and guidance counselors and we had face-to-face -face personal meetings with every one of those students. Uh, so it, essentially saying we believe you can do well in an AP class. It's not just opinion. Here's the numbers that say you can, and we think when registration opens here in a couple of weeks that you should take an AP class. So we had the face-to-face -face meeting and sent a letter home to their parents. Uh, we also did something uh, different where we recruited all of our um, ninth grade pre-AP U.S. history students for uh, three sections of sophomore-only AP Euro history. There would only be sophomores in those classes and uh, they were identified by the, the ninth grade um, uh, pre-AP U.S. history teacher as they should be successful in the course. Um, so we did, we did those things and then I, for, during the registration season I put together a um, document that had all of our AP courses divided by sections uh, or divided by departments and then identified six courses as starter courses. So if they're considering the class, weren't quite sure, maybe they should take the starter course and then that was be a way that they could dip their toe in the water. So was it successful? You can go to the next slide. Yes, very much so. Uh, 436 personal meetings out of 616 total recruited. So we got 79 sophomores, incoming sophomores to take 
um, AP European History. Um, 19 of those students at attended a one-week AP boot camp this summer so that uh, Mr. Lober, our uh, AP, uh, AP European History teacher, could teach them this is what it looks like in AP classes when they say write an essay, when they say read, when we say take notes. This is how you do that. I um, mean, also gave those students a, a little bit of a jump start on his AP Euro class. Um, Numbers-wise, we had 704 enrollments in AP classes last year. We had 1,040 this year. So uh, the joke that I've made is I kind of feel like the dog who caught the car. You know, we've been chasing it and chasing it, and now we caught it, and it's, oh, boy, what do we do with this? 48% uh, jump in enrollment was far more successful than we expected. Um, of the kids that we recruited, 73% of them actually enrolled. And of the face-to-face -face meetings, 68% of those kids actually took an AP class. Of the, our 531 total students taking AP classes at Central this year, 296 of them are taking one for the first time ever. And a significant portion of those students likely would not have taken any an AP course had we not done this program. So it's something we are already in the process of building the spreadsheets again for next year. Thank you. Do you have time for some questions? Sure, oh, okay. yes, please. <laughs> So how many sections was that with that many students? Well, it's um, uh, 50? It, it depends. I think we offer around, what is it, 23 AP courses. So it's divided by, what, what was our total, 1,048. 1, so our class averages are around between 20 and 31 right now in those classes, unfortunately. So that math would give you. I had one extra. <laughs> <laughs> mine, you didn't bring the math teacher. Mine increased by a section this year as Mine well. increased by um, a section. The biggest thing was in social studies where yeah. Don has those three new sections of sophomores that sophomores wouldn't have been in that class this time last year. Psychology so. went from 48 kids to 170. So it's because that was identified as a starter course. AP Art History went from one section to two. AP um, Gov increased by one. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, correct. Wow. That's, a, that's very impressive. Uh, so. Um, Tell me a little bit about boot camp. What, what takes place there? You don't make them out and run, do you? <laughs> Push-ups. It was way too hot. It was in July, so it was way too hot for that. But one, one of the things we tackled was that there's a, a fear, and uh, rightly so, um, uh, that if these students have never been in, in an AP class, an honors class, and all of a sudden we put them in one, that it's some different expectations in, in how they're going to manage their study habits and their test-taking skills and their, their time management pieces. So we wanted to, our, our hope was that we invited the sophomores in their first AP class to take that prior to doing it with the hopes of better preparing them. Our, the thought was if we can better prepare them, they have more success that sophomore year. Once a quarter during seminar, we're going to bring those kids down and review those things we talked about in the, in the summer to keep make sure they're implemented during the school year. When they become juniors and seniors, they're better prepared students to tackle AP courses, which makes a better environment for the staff and for the kids. And over the next 10, 20 years, that continues to grow in supporting our kids and our staff. So that's the hope. Yeah, I, I would just be excited to hear the results at the we end are, of this year. Um, just, you know, you had such a, an increase in enrollment, uh, increase of additional classes. So if those are students that weren't necessarily considering taking that class, now please bring back the results. Yes, I'd like absolutely. to hear that. We will, we will for sure. Can you tell us about your experience taking AP class? I'm sure you've taken a few <laughs> with a 4.8. <laughs> um, my first AP class was actually with Miss Peniel um, my sophomore year. I took two classes then, and I'm taking six this year. Um, <laughs> so we're probably running out of sections for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think it's definitely something I totally agree that if you're college bound, it's something that you want to do, and it definitely has an advantage to it. Yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, my nervous junior uh, daughter is one of the 296 first timers. All right. And uh, hopefully next year she'll do more. Great. She's excited. Awesome. You know, there's so much research that shows that if they take it, even if they don't perform incredibly well, they're going to be more likely to succeed in college. And that's, and that's what we want to do be exposed to the rigor, the expectations, and help them become less fearful of the hard things they are going to tackle in life. And this is another example that you can do hard things. So we're excited about the attempt. I think it's the right thing to do. Mr. Hain? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, do we still have open enrollment if somebody just walks in and says they want to do it, or do they have to meet certain criteria, number one? 
for, for the most part, I mean, we're, we're, if we, we're not going to set a kid up if they've only had geometry and they want to go into AP, calc. A, you know, AP Calc. Um, but for the most part, uh, if, if a kid wants in the class, they can, they can get in the class. Okay, because there are all those. AP Psych, AP, um, um, AP, US, his, um, uh, AP US History, AP World History, um, uh, AP European History, all courses you can take without a lot of prereqs. Um, art History is the same way. Uh, physics, um, Chemistry, Cal, Spanish. Those, um, Spanish. Uh, Spanish 5, those are classes that if you don't have the prereqs to build the base, you're going to ex ex struggle extremely. So it's, we try to make sure we put them in successful situations. Right, okay. And then um, I know that, you know, me, it, I was impressed by the fact that you guys are following up with these kids instead of throwing them in there and letting them go. So that was, that's awesome. Um, two other things. Have we done any data or research on how much money we're saving these kids and these families by having these AP classes as opposed to having to take these. The I was going to say the sponsor should be able to answer that based on two daughters. <laughs> and I throw it down, Paul, not every college accepts every right. AP class. And just like if you go to UMSL for three years and transfer to the zoo, they're not going to take all your classes. So right. there is that transfer issue. But for the most part, we, we had a student, Mr. Uh, uh, Blaybaum, who was introduced to his older brother, walked at Mizzou two years ago with 48 credit hours accepted at Mizzou. So that's, you know, almost three years done. And he's in the medical program. He's just, his mother's very excited mm -hmm. about, about that opportunity of acceptance of credit. And that, that's one of the things I wanted to make sure that, you know, that it is a significant cost savings. I mean, you can have a year or, or two years out of the way. Yeah, so, so that's something that's, that, you know, doesn't go unnoticed in that. And then the other question, last but not least, how soon can we get this in the other two high schools? They're already working on it. Okay. The, the, we're, we were in the pilot days. The principals are very excited. We met uh, last week in our principals' mm -hmm. PLC and, and, and reviewed everything. They're, they're doing the same things now. We can't wait to have it all at all three campuses. Awesome. Thank and you, guys. And before we actually, just one note on that, before we actually ran it last year, I had the, the assistance of Brian Thompson over at Howell who took the, the, the predictor formula that we had, and he used Francis Howell High School data from several years ago and ran it in a, 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 an access uh, database and found a .62 correlation, predictive correlation, between um, being in identified by that formula and successfully passing an AP class, which in the... You know, in the world, field of statistics, 0.62 correlation is incredibly high. So he, he kind of ran a practice run on that for us, and that, that perked their ears up, and they were already talking about doing that this year. And then, then that, that was one of the things that gave us the confidence that the students that we were identifying really could be successful. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Good work. Thank you. And keep up the good work. Thank you. Board of a motion to approve the uh, August 2016 financial statements is presented. So moved. Motion by Mr. Summers, second by Ms. Ferguson. Is there any discussion? Hearing none by roll call. Mr. Hain? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. We're only to a motion to approve purchase over 7,500 as presented. Motion by Ms. Cope, second by Ms. Ferguson. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none by roll call. Mr. LaFada? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> Item number 14 is a motion, uh, I understand a motion to set the 2016 tax rate fund by as follows. Incidental, $2.19.54. Teachers, $2.9.18. Debt service, $0.00 and 67.13 cents. Capital projects, zero dollars and 60 cents. And so, I'm sorry, six cents. And total levy of five dollars and 1.85 cents. So I'm glad there's a first and a second because I want to read that again. <clears throat> 
Any discussion, board? By roll call. Mr. Summer. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Board of Attend motion to approve the vending budget for fiscal year 2017 as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. Haynes, second by Ms. Cope uh, to approve the uh, vending revenue budget as presented. Any discussion, board? By roll call. Mr. Summer. Aye. 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 And reason for extension. One of my clients is recipient of that Okay. Six zero one. <clears throat> Item number fourteen. Motion to approve the contract extension with first student. Incorporated for operations of the district school transportation services as presented. Second. Motion by Ms. Ferguson, second by Mr. Hain. Is there any discussion, board? By roll call? Ms. Cope? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. Ms. Hendricks Harris. Yeah, just a few things tonight. Uh, this past week, we had over 100 people sign up for Parent University, and the surveys have come in. The event showed participants were extremely happy with this event, the vast majority giving it the highest ranking possible on all questions. So it was a huge success. Um, thanks to Dr. Garland and Jen Henry for uh, organizing and, and pulling that event off. Um, in addition to the partnership award earned earlier this year by Francis Hall Middle, Barnwell Middle School earned 2016 Promising Practice Partnership Recognition from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we also this week hosted a PALS breakfast for about a dozen of our senior citizens. Uh, they were able to learn about our lunch program, hear about Proposition Howell, listen to the Fairmont fifth grade choir, and take a tour of the library, including learning about some maker spaces. Before we meet next, we will celebrate Custodian and Maintenance Week. On behalf of the district, I would like to thank all of our staff who work each day to take care of our students and staff by cleaning and maintaining our facilities. Uh, these employees are an important part of our success. We know our clean, well-maintained, and operational buildings are our reflection of our district. I would like to remind the board that we have a Proposition Hall informational meeting September 20th at Francis Hall Central. And then last but not least, just want to acknowledge that tonight we recognize some of our outstanding students and academic programs. We are very proud of the AP Best Practice Program that was presented tonight, our AP scholars and our STAR students. We do an excellent job of recognizing our leaders and students in the area of academics and want to thank all that were involved in um, getting here tonight and bringing them here tonight. Uh, the Friends Health Central presentation that you saw tonight is a great example of the professional learning that our um, administrators and teachers do together and it was nice to see it in action and how it affects directly our students. And so that was not just a great best practice, it was a great example of professional learning and the team coming together to, to learn about things outside of school and how it can improve our practice on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, it was a great example of a few things that was brought here tonight. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Um, Elise, thanks for being with us tonight. This is your time to... Um, let us know what you thought of the meeting and see how we can improve. You've been to a lot of meetings, I'm sure, so no, but tell us a little bit about where you're, you're heading for school or where you think you're going and what you hope to achieve. Um, I'm currently undecided for college. Um, I plan to go into actuarial science, but besides that, really anywhere at this point. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I don't really have much to say. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at graduation this year, so, or next year. So. <laughs> Item number 16 is Board of Education request uh, for future agenda items. Uh, is there anybody who has any? Yeah, I just had uh, just a bit of a concern and wanted to share my concern with the rest of the board. And, and it has to do, uh, for some time, uh, I've been going over and looking at different districts' websites and noticed that 
we're one of the, the only school districts in St. Charles County that post the board members' home addresses on the website. And uh, only seven out of 58 in the St. Louis area do this. And they had an incident a while back where uh, a curriculum change at a school district in St. Louis, and it's one of the districts that had the uh, addresses of the board members on the website. And they actually had protesters showing up at the board members' houses. And uh, I was just a little bit concerned by, you know, if there was if there was a reason why we have it on there, only because I have, you know, young kids at home, and not that it might ever happen, might not ever happen, but just as a safety precaution, not, you know, this day and age. And I just wanted to bring that up to see, you know, and, and I have a list that I couldn't get printed out, but of all the districts and who has it and who don't, but seven out of 58, you know, I, I think it's something we should take a look at, maybe about not having it on there. I mean, people can do it if they want to research it and find it, but putting it right out there for them, it's, it's a little scary at times. And that's all. So um, would you like to have a, I mean, I don't even know if this requires a vote, to be honest with you. If, what I recall us discussing at retreat was this was a time for the board to make requests of administration and to make sure that we had consensus giving us direction. Right. So if that is consensus and direction, we will be happy to make those changes. I don't, I don't have a problem with it either way. So, um, I mean, I'm, no, no, this is if we want to give direction to the administration just to take it off. So I, I would support that request. Um, I would as well. And Michelle said yes to. Um, and I, I am happy to talk about school business and school board business. I don't necessarily want to do that on my front porch. I'd rather do it here. So I would support that. And just to add, whether it's on our website or not, and I, I'm indifferent about it, that information is available. We're all elected sure. officials. And that's all available through the Missouri Ethics Commission or the County Election Authority. So whether they get it from our website or another source, that information is still available out there. Well, we can have it off the website tomorrow then. Okay. That's fine. Doesn't matter to me either way. <clears throat> all right. Um, you know, one other item, uh, and I, I don't know if we can discuss it during upcoming meetings or not, but something that we need to... Uh, probably pinned down uh, at some point is um, have a discussion uh, about um, in the event that tax increase does not pass. Um, I think it's appropriate to have that discussion and have somewhat of a plan in place uh, to begin um, to give the administration some direction on um, how we how we plan on balancing the budget going forward. So. Um, if it's okay with the board, um, I would, you know, I think that we should probably do that before the election, um, and at least have a discussion and give the give the administration some direction as to uh, how we will address this, and maybe we take some recommendations uh, from the administration to consider. So we could do a work session. I know that oftentimes is the preference of the board prior to making some of those bigger decisions, and we could do that October twentieth. Okay. Could could we um, could you give us bring some recommendations on what areas you think that we might consider uh, from a priority standpoint, so that we can be you know prepared either way. I mean, I'm hopeful that. Our, our taxpayers will approve the increase, uh, but if they don't, uh, we have to have a, a plan in place and begin addressing uh, the shortfall, uh, you know, immediately. So, um, you know, there's only so much you can do in this physical year, but um, you know, we're coming up on a budget year, uh, budget work, uh, work, and we have to begin that process. So, um, I'm guessing that we. You're saying October? Do we, have two, do we have two meetings in October? That's, is one option. There's only one? The other one is after the election. Uh, one of the things I know the board understands is that we could bring you some, a list of some options to cut and that that would get more specific the closer to staffing and budget time that we got. So 
Well, we do typically like to get, seek a lot of input. We could bring you that initial list of our ideas and our thoughts, and that would get more refined over the course of time. So it really would be more of a discussion at that point. Um, but certainly we give the board some opportunity to weigh in on, on some of those, thought, our initial thoughts. Okay. I, I was wondering if maybe we should try to do that on the November meeting, and then we would be able to respond by adding additional things or deleting things at that point in time, because then we would have no, instead of talking about something that may or may not happen, uh, I don't know if that's something no. the rest of the board wants to do or. So Michelle also has a comment. I'm gonna put her up to the speaker. Go ahead, Michelle. I, I'm just concerned that it will appear that we are kind of jumping the gun because we're talking about cuts for next school year. Is that, that's correct, right? Yes. I just don't know that we need to have a conversation about next school year's budget prior to the election. I just fear that the community would think that that was a scare tactic. Oh, I, I don't disagree, but uh, my, my only thought process is that if we wait and wait and wait, and then it, then it happens, then, we, then we've got a lot more work to do. So, you know, I was just thinking that maybe we need to at least have some initial discussions or thoughts to give these guys uh, some direction as to how how the board would like to move forward. I, you know, I don't think that you can. It's certainly not. A, I'm not looking. Uh, I was not considering that we would have answers to what's going to happen, and say, "Oh, this is going to happen." But I, I think we need to start working on a blueprint. Uh, and that's going to take some time, and I don't think that we need to. We should wait, but you know, if it's, it's the, you know, the the item can be put on the agenda with or without, without the board's approval. Um, each member can do that, but I would like consensus on on when when we'd like to start the discussion. I'd like to do it in November. Okay. I agree with November. November. Okay, November. So, that, so we'll do it immediately after the election mm -hmm. and start the process then. So we'll skip it for the 20th meeting. And I, you know, I'm I'm open to either either thing. I just you know, I just don't want to you know um, begin that process too late because uh, we have a, a rookie this year doing our staffing. <laughs> She's going to have some work to do. So get somebody new. But, okay. Uh, any any changes for the October meeting or the November meeting? Mr. Summer. Just a quick question. October 20th, uh, policy review, second reading. It, does that need to go away? That needs to go okay. away. Okay. Policy committee didn't meet. Right. All right. And then the other thing is just to follow up. Uh, does the board want to have a brief time at the October meeting to follow up on MSBA conference to tell something you learned while you were there that might help other board members that weren't able to attend the same session? I would like that. I would like that as well. All right, so why don't we plan on just two minutes, one session that you found insightful while you were there. So that, that means it furthers my education by just sitting in the boardroom. So <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Good luck. <laughs> All right, anything else on the 20th or the 17th? Any changes, administration? So let me just ask, the board members are going to share some ideas of things that they've learned. Would you like to do that during best practices and have us move the best practices around a little so that could be your best practice night? Or do you want to do that in addition to? We, we, we don't want to deprive you of best practices. Is that during best practice time? How about A and B? Okay, got it. Anything on the... Mr. Lapata, we yes. had uh, shared with the board previously the concept of a uh, feasibility study for on-site clinics, and I anticipate that the purchases over $7,500 on October 20th will contain a recommendation. I just want to give the boards a heads up on that since it's yeah. a, uh, something new and different. And that'll be, you said, October 20th as well? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. We're, are we done with the 20th, Mr. Dyke? 17th? All right. Now we're on November 17th. So, um, 
Shall we begin a workshop at that point? That's after the election? Yes, we have two on there, but we will do we our best. We can always cancel the workshop if uh, we're free. I think, I think, we, I think we added in, we can make adjustments to the length of time of the others if need be. Okay. I, I think that it would be a great idea to have a work session scheduled after the election in November, uh, because if it passes, we may not need to have that work session. Like you said, we can cancel it, uh, but I think it'd be good to have that on there. Any other changes? Okay. Hearing none, okay, motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> motion by Mr. Summers, second by Ms. Walker. We're going to give it to her. She <clears throat> by roll call. Ms. Ferguson. Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Board members' addresses have been removed from the website.